Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Allison Wood. I'm a partner at McGuire Woods, and I am joined today by two of my other partners, Katie DeLuca, who's a partner in our Richmond office, uh, who uh, deals with federal securities law and corporate governance issues. And then my other partner, Aaron Flynn, who is in the Washington, D.C. office with me. Both Aaron and I uh, do environmental law with, um, you know, and are well known for our air and uh, climate practices. And uh, we will be talking today with all of you about the uh, new hot topic of uh, environmental, social, and governance, or ESG issues, and, and what is happening in that arena. Just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go through just what some of the basics of this issue are. Uh, the SEC disclosure requirements around it, voluntary standards. Uh, Aaron and I are going to give you a, a case study, um, one of a large investor-owned utility and one of a large global investment firm, just to let you know what other people are doing in this space. Uh, we're going to talk some about what the Department of Labor is doing and then risks that you need to be aware of in the ESG space. One thing I wanted to mention is that when we talk about things in the case study, there is no confidential information in there. Anything we're talking about is uh, publicly available when we're talking about anything specific to a company. I didn't want you to think that we would uh, be giving away any information for from our clients. We would never do that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there is a question function here in the webinar, and please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. We may not have time to get to them today. We're going to be very strict about trying to finish within one hour. But if you have put in a question, uh, we will get back to you via email to answer it. So um, please feel free to, to use that function. And with that, let's get started. Uh, the uh, first thing is just to have a quick overview of what, what are the issues that you need to be aware of when you're thinking about, about ESG, and, and, you're, and this is sort of the themes for what we're going to talk about today. So the first is, you know, what is the scope of ESG? And there isn't, you'll, you might be surprised to know there isn't actually a, a firm answer to that. You know, different people define it different ways, and in, and in some ways that can make things more difficult. How do you align your policies and goals with your overall company objectives? I mean, sometimes there can be tension, and oftentimes there can be tension between those goals and, and the overall objectives of the company. So how, how do you align those? And then finally, in this era where so many people are wanting ESG information, how do you give that to them, to investors and other stakeholders, while minimizing your risks in doing so? ESG is, as I said, challenging because it can mean different things to different people. So you need to be careful when you're talking with people about ESG to be sure that you're talking about the same things. The scope has um, evolved considerably over just a few years. And really, this started out a lot being discussed as being sustainability and really was focused more on climate change and resource impacts. But over time, it's moved then into the corporate responsibility, and now we've seen it merge into the ESG space. And it encompasses much more now than just climate and environmental impacts. ESG can look at all sorts of things, like what are your labor practices? How are your executives paid? Is there a large gap between executive pay and other pay within your company? What's the company's diversity? How does it manage its talent? Where is it making its political contributions? And a lot of times it, it is now starting to evolve into what associations are you part of? What are you supporting and what do those associations stand for? What are your social policies? What are your product safety things? And it's even started to move its way into things like data security. So it can encompass a wide range of things. To further complicate matters, different constituencies want different types of ESG information. So for example, you have investors and financial institutions, and what they're looking for is hard data that's relevant to their investment um, decisions. And so what's most useful for them are data that are published consistently and maybe year after year so that they can do a comparison. They also want to see what are the company's plans for managing long-term risk associated with climate change 
To further complicate things, short-term investors might want something different. On the other hand, your corporate executives and your board members, what the information they're wanting is to let them see how they're stacking up against their peers. They want to see what types of investments are being made by their peers. What types of policies are they putting in place? What are investors demanding from their peers? Who's giving it to them? And if they are giving it to them, how are they being rewarded for it? So that's the sort of thing that you see there. In the advocacy group arena, I touched on this a moment ago when I talked about the fact that people are now monitoring where are you giving your political contributions? Where are your association memberships at? And very recently, a very large Norwegian pension fund divested itself of two large uh, oil companies over those two companies' lobbying activities, finding that the lobbying activities uh, were not in line with uh, climate change, the climate change policies they wanted to see. Finally, um, S&P has announced that it's going to start scoring co the companies based on their ESG performance. This is pretty new. Um, companies will be getting global ESG scores. And it's intended to help uh, investment firms and individual investors prioritize um, funding sustainable companies. And uh, they've noted that the pandemic, COVID-19, has really pushed these issues to the forefront because you've seen the impact of what um, the quarantine and the pandemic has done in carbon heavy sectors and that were especially hard hit. And those sectors would be expected to also be hard hit in um, a climate change era. So with that, let's now talk a little bit about, oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. Uh, you can see here the uh, how reporting has gone up over time in a very short period of time. In 2011, what you can see is that the red, uh, very few um, companies were reporting, uh, making some sort of ESG reporting. Uh, this is in the S&P 500, all the way up to where we are now, which is where only 14% of the S&P 500 are not doing reporting in some form or fashion. And now we will, uh, I'm gonna turn uh, the, the floor over to Katie, and she's gonna talk about what your requirements are if you're a publicly traded company um, with regard to the SEC. Great, thanks, Allison. Um, one of the places that ESC disclosures from U.S. public companies can be found is in the filings that they're required to make with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, this would include their prospectuses, proxy statements, and annual reports. Um, but there are many people who think that the SEC disclosure requirements do not go far enough and would like the SEC to establish additional mandatory reporting requirements for various ESG topics. Now, for decades, um, you know, various groups have been advocating for more SEC-mandated social and environmental disclosures. Um, but to date, the staff has, the SEC has done a pretty good job at resisting these pressures. Um, and this is because the SEC um, has viewed ESG topics as generally falling outside of its mission. Um, and that mandatory disclosures on ESG matters could potentially distract from its mandate, which is to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. So with this mission in mind, it's not all that surprising that SEC disclosure requirements focus on financial and economic performance measures as well as disclosure of non-financial items that impact a company's financial and economic performance. Now, the touchstone for SEC disclosure requirements is, requirements is its standard of materiality. And generally speaking, um, it is this standard that uh, determines the scope of what most companies, um, the specific company disclosures issuers need to make in their SEC reports. And in this context, um, information is material if there is a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would attach importance to it uh, when making an investment decision in the company's securities or um, potentially when voting at a shareholder meeting. It does not include information that an investor might consider important. Um, the SEC you know, has stated over the years that there are simply too many different topics covered by ESG that interest in these topics um, is subjective and variable. 
um, and that if it were to start mandating ESG disclosures in SEC reports, the reports themselves would probably become unreadable. The material information, you know, the information about financial performance and business risk could possibly become obscured and de-emphasized. It's also important to note that including ESG disclosures in SEC reports, you know, rather than in like a separate sustainability publication, for example, also subjects this disclosure to a private right of action for material misstatements and omissions and can also lead to enforcement actions by the SEC and other agencies. So with this background, you know, not surprisingly, there are only a few ESG disclosures that are specifically mandated by the SEC, SEC's rules. So this list has definitely been expanded over recently year, recent years. Um, for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm going to focus on environmental disclosure requirements only. Uh, first, um, every company needs, public company needs to provide a fairly extensive description of its business and its prospectuses and annual reports. One of these items um, that this disclosure must include is a description of the material effects that compliance with environmental laws has on an issuer's earnings and competitive position. Um, and also it needs to disclose any material capital expenditures for environmental control facilities. Um, the SEC has also said in guidance um, that this disclosure should also discuss the impact of laws relating to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, companies are also required to uh, provide disclosure regarding various legal proceedings in which it is a party and uh, the disclosure rule sets out very specific standards for proceedings concerning environmental regulations. Um, a public company must disclose any environmental legal proceeding to which it's a party if, the, if that proceeding is material to the registrant's business or financial condition, or if it potentially involves damages greater than 10% of the company's current assets, or if a governmental authority is a party to the potential sanction, is a party to the proceeding, and potential sanctions are greater than one hundred percent, one hundred thousand dollars. Now, um, this one hundred thousand dollars threshold is obviously very low, and it results in a lot of disclosures about legal proceedings that issuers have argued for a long time are immaterial to a reasonable investor. Now, importantly. Over the past few years, the SEC has been engaging in a major overhaul of its primary disclosure rules with the goal of modernizing and streamlining, streamlining them. And as a part of this modernization initiative, um, the SEC changed this $100,000 threshold. Uh, it increased it to $300,000, or alternatively, um, an issuer can set its own higher threshold now, uh, but such threshold needs to be reasonably designed to, dis to disclose material environmental proceedings, and, and importantly, it may not exceed $1 million or 1% of the registrant's current assets. The next disclosure requirement that the SEC has expressly said should address um, environmental matters is, or more specifically climate change, is a company's risk factors. Uh, registrants are, um, under the SEC rules, registrants are required to disclose the most significant factors that make an investment in its securities risky. And the SEC has specifically said that these risk factors should cover climate change risks that are specific to the issuer. And over the years, we've seen a significant increase in the number of risk factors that cover climate change. Um, oops, sorry. Went ahead too quickly. Um, the SEC has also indicated that um, these issues on uh, climate change risk may also need to be uh, covered in a company's MDNA. And very generally speaking, um, the purpose of the MDNA is for management to discuss the company's results of operations and to describe any known trends, events, or uncertainties. Um, that may have or that may have had or could have a material effect on the company's financial condition or operating performance. 
Um, issuers are also encouraged to include in the, their MDNAs any other non-financial statistical data that, um, in management's judgment, could enhance the reader's understanding of these disclosures. Now, in you know, this current environment, not surprisingly, we are seeing more and more companies include ESG disclosures and data points in their MDNAs, especially regarding climate change and emission reporting. But this needs to be done carefully and thoughtfully. Um, just this past January, uh, the SEC published new guidance on MDNA disclosures, specifically discussing the requirements for any non-financial data that is included in MDNAs. This guidance um, highlights the care that companies must take before adding any additional non-financial information you know, into its SEC reports, including ESG data, and also the appropriate context for such data that companies must also provide in order to make the presentation of these metrics not misleading. So our next important question is, what can we expect the SEC to require um, going forward? Will they um, institute more mandatory disclosure requirements regarding climate change or any other you know, ESG topic for that matter? And the SEC certainly has broad enough authority to do so. Interestingly, however, you know, in the recent, uh, this recent significant undertaking that the SEC undertook to modernize its disclosure requirements, it did not address or add any new ESG disclosures to its revised rules, except to add a very general mandate that companies must discuss their material human capital management matters. Now, this um, upset a lot of groups who had been pushing for the SEC to include more climate change disclosure requirements specifically. And as Commissioner Lee put out, expressed in a public statement that she made on the SEC's disclosure modernization efforts, it is, quote, most noticeable for what it does not do, make any attempt to address investors' needs for standardized disclosure on climate change risk. Um, also of note, this past spring, or this just this recently, the SEC's own Investor Advisory Committee recommended the Commission amend its reporting requirements to include ESG factors. Um, still, you know, despite this pressure, in all likelihood, uh, whether or not we're going to see more SEC-mandated, um, you know, disclosures regarding climate change or ESG, anytime soon will probably depend for the most part on the outcome of the um, elections this fall. So now, Aaron, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to you. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about uh, the, the voluntary standards that have arisen to sort of fill the gap that's been left by uh, the lack of of more rigorous SEC requirements, and uh, because obviously there's so much interest in this type of information, uh, a variety of groups have sprung up over the years. This is just a handful of them, uh, each one with its own approach, its own different approach to doing voluntary reporting, uh, covering different types of emissions, different scopes of emissions when it comes to the environmental side of things, uh, focusing on different types of governance issues, uh, and with different levels of uh, sophistication and comprehensiveness. Some of these different standard setting uh, organizations give you a, a fairly basic template for a report. Others have detailed web-based platforms for answering questionnaires that are, that, you know, they lead you through step by step, but they're incredibly complicated and have, uh, they seek a, a ton of different information. So we obviously can't go through every single one of these uh, and what they, they talk about, but I thought we could talk about one. Uh, I picked SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, uh, because it's been around probably the longest of these groups. It's, it's not the gold standard. It is uh, certainly a very prominent uh, organization in this space. And I should mention, actually, uh, although there are all these different platforms right now, I literally read this morning because there's ESG news every single day, uh, that five of these groups, including SASB, uh, have banded together now to come up with a uniform approach uh, to ESG reporting, at least uniform amongst those five big groups, uh, including CDP, for instance, so another very prominent one. So uh, 
Uh, that's a space to be watching. I'm obviously going to delve into that in a lot more detail in the coming days to see if there's going to be a public process for participating in that, which I would expect. Uh, so, but turning first to just one example of how they do this. Uh, for SASB, which was founded back in 2011, which if, we, if you think back to the slide Allison showed uh, at the beginning with the rise in reporting, 2011 is when, when there were only 20% of S&P 500 companies reporting. So SASB sort of got in on uh, the ground with its standards. Uh, and they have identified 77 different specific industries and developed standards for each one of those industries, depending on uh, the, the features of that industry and where their various emissions or governance issues uh, or social policy issues might be most important, uh, tailoring those standards for particular industries. That's been the trend in this area all along. Uh, lots of industries like the electric utility industry and the oil and gas industry have worked to create their own standards themselves that are specific to their industries. And I picked the electric uh, utility industry because they've been doing this probably longer than any other industry. Uh, they you know, heavily regulated, have to do a lot of environmental reporting uh, pursuant to EPA regulations. That's, that's sort of how I got started in this area in the first place was uh, greenhouse gas reporting requirements for the oil and gas industry and, and, uh, and monitoring issues uh, obviously spread much larger now into this whole voluntary system. So for electric utilities, it's just an example. The, the topics that SASB wants information on are you know, greenhouse gas emissions, energy resource planning. Uh, those two things obviously go hand in hand, uh, but, but cover a lot of different issues. Air quality issues, water management, coal ash management, management, energy affordability, workforce health and safety, end use efficiency and demand, so what your consumers are, are doing, nuclear safety and emergency management and grid resiliency issues. So a broad range of things, not just environmentally focused. Uh, diving in a little bit deeper just into the climate change related issues, these are the topics that SASB asks for information uh, from the electric utility industry. And when you look at these, I won't read every single one of them, but take the first one, for example, it's a quantitative accounting of your of the utilities direct scope one emissions, the emissions that come from their activities generating power uh, and reporting that that information is something that utilities have done for a long time. And there are well established principles for how to do that. But if you go down to the third one, there's also a much more qualitative approach in the discussion and analysis category where they're supposed to talk about their long term and short term strategies about how they're going to how they're going to manage their emissions and uh, how they're going to how they have been performing against their various targets and what those targets are going to be going forward. A couple other things that I thought were interesting from the SASB materials on VHG emissions for the utility industry in particular that I thought I'd pull out. And there's indeed there's a lot to, to pull out, but these are just a handful of examples. Uh, as I, I think alluded to on the previous slide, uh, the methodology for accounting for CO2 equivalent of scope one emissions uh, has been standardized to reflect, to align with EPA's greenhouse gas uh, reporting inventory uh, rules and guidance, which is an important thing for industries that have to do this type of reporting uh, pursuant to federal or, and state regulatory requirements, not creating some different methodology that just ignores the fact that there is good data available uh, and, and creating some sort of duplicative requirement is an important thing to do, and uh, the SASB standards reflect that. Uh, also, I thought of interest, uh, there, there's a requirement to discuss any change in emissions from previous reporting periods and to explain why those changes occurred. Uh, was it because you installed emission reduction technology like carbon capture and sequestration, or was it because you divested certain types of assets or acquired new assets that are higher emitting or lower emitting. Uh, as I said on the previous slide, you have to explain what your reduction targets are and analyze your performance against those targets and also have to describe a strategy to manage risks and opportunities associated with greenhouse gas uh, regulatory developments uh, and how those regulatory developments might affect business structure, uh, how it might affect deployment of new technologies or changes to your fleet how you might be engaged in lobbying to influence regulators and how you might be involved in, in green power markets.
So the SASB approach is obviously not the only approach. And as you may have gathered from the, what I was describing with respect to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the SASB standard really is focused on scope one emissions for utilities. Uh, there are also some scope two emissions in there as well uh, in other parts of the uh, of the SASB guidance, but other organizations like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure and CDP also go after scope three emissions. And that is that is certainly where a lot of uh, new developments seem to be focused for not just the utility industry, but for, you know, all industry across the board and coming up with methodologies to quantify scope three emissions and what can companies do to address them if they're setting targets is a really big challenge that is going to be, I think, a major issue going forward. On the flip side, the United States Chamber of Commerce has been advocating for a number of years now uh, for a much more hands-off approach than what we've seen from some of the other groups uh, in terms of going after increasing amounts of information. Uh, the Chambers project, and they haven't created their own standards, I should say. They have put out a number of policy uh, papers, and they are working on their own type of standards. But uh, from the policy positions they've mapped up, they, and I think they're definitely going to look very different than what you've seen from some of the other groups. Their high priority is keeping ESG entirely voluntary and keeping it out of SEC filings. They don't want those things mixed up uh, together. They don't think they belong together and that they can cause, uh, in particular, if they are part of an SEC filing, they can cause confusion for investors. They also emphasize strongly the variability among different industries and also among individual companies. So their strong position that they advocate is uh, a one-size-fits-all approach, even within an industry, even in an industry-specific standard, is not good enough, and companies should be able to pick and choose, uh, let's just say, from SASB or from CDP. These are the things that we think are important for our particular company to report on and, and to be able to do that without being penalized. For some of these reporting platforms, if you don't report on specific issues, you get knocked down a peg because they actually give you a grade, a lettered grade, uh, uh, as to how good your, your ESG reporting is. And that can be problematic for companies uh, who don't want to have a, a D or a C plus uh, next to their name. So changing gears from, from just a general description of the voluntary standards, I thought we'd talk about a couple case studies. Allison and I will go through that. Um, First off, one of the things that we, we cover for a number of clients, uh, we, we have a group that focuses on ESG issues, and we monitor always what, what are companies saying now? Uh, what are their newest ESG-related pledges? What are they putting in their reports? What have they committed to? And you'll, you see so much uh, activity. There's, there's literally a news story about this every single day with Etsy saying that it is going to offset all of its emissions related to shipping its products and with Chevron uh, agreeing to uh, commit to the Paris Climate Accord to the, to the actions that it would have to take in order to be consistent with the Paris Accord. Uh, and Shell saying it's going to be carbon neutral, completely carbon neutral by 2050. And then you've got banks, the financial institutions, uh, in most prominently City and, and Bank of America, uh, most recently joining a group that uh, not only uh, have they agreed to uh, disclose all of their lobbying efforts, but uh, they've also joined a group that is developing standards for how financial institutions can account for the emissions that are associated with their investments, their loans, and, and it's, a, it's very complicated. It's, it's still getting off the ground, but they put forward a, the first draft of what those standards are going to be with those banks' input. So that's going to be, I think, an incredibly interesting area to watch for additional developments. But I thought we would go through a couple examples. I'm going to talk about a utility, uh, a major uh, investor-owned utility that has, uh, I think, set a pretty high mark for what types of targets they've set and what, how they're reporting on them. Uh, and as Allison said, all from publicly available information. So the first thing that I think is interesting to note, uh, and I've seen this with more and more companies, um, the reporting platforms that this particular utility uh, uses, not just one, they've adopted the SASB report, they do the CDP questionnaire for climate and water, they've adopted the task force uh, 
uh, policies as well. They do they use the EEI, that's the Edison Electric Institute ESG platform, an industry specific platform that was developed early on. They do GRI, and they also do these uh, custom-made customer emission reports that link various high-usage customers, uh, industrial customers, to uh, the emissions that are generated based on their consumption. So th this is mostly taking the same data over and over again and applying it in different platforms. Very time-consuming, uh, and, you're, and you're getting slightly different perspectives, different interpretations of the same data, but perhaps this is not the most convenient way uh, or the most efficient way to be doing reporting. So uh, the news that I was just reporting on about the five groups trying to come up with a more harmonized approach uh, might help companies to avoid having to do this level of, of duplicative work uh, to the extent it's, it's, it is really overlapping. Uh, so to the extent that companies are thinking about adding platforms to uh, to what they're doing now, it might be a good time to pause on that and to evaluate uh, what the new standards from the from the five group consortium might end up looking like. Uh, so beyond the reporting platforms they they use, this utility explains in detail who has responsibility for ESG within the company and what that uh, ESG team is supposed to do. It's, it's definitely very common these days for companies to have ESG devoted teams or sustainability devoted teams that are really focused on these issues. In fact, we were working with, with another company that was just establishing one and it was frankly surprising that they, that they were so late to doing that. Um, so this particular utility has established a cross-functional team, people from all throughout the company to identify new and emerging ESG issues and to develop strategies for responding to them. That is pretty much a best practice at this point. Uh, this is so cross-sectional and it implicates so many different things. You can't just have the environmental staff do this. It has to involve a lot of different people, including your SEC experts as well, your, your in-house lawyers. Uh, they've also added ESG to uh, their, their general uh, corporate strategy risk reporting because they've identified it as a major risk. Uh, for all of the ESG issues that they identify, they conduct a materiality assessment to focus on what they need to disclose and to inform how they're going to engage on those issues. And they've got that team of people responsible for proactively communicating uh, their ESG strategy throughout the company and, and beyond, outside of the company as well, engaging executives and the board on ESG issues, making sure they're up to date and informed about them. Uh, which is an increasingly important thing for a lot of financial institutions. If the board is not engaged on ESG, that's a big problem uh, in terms of their ev evaluation of those companies. And they also manage the, the public-facing website that discloses all this ESG information. Uh, with respect to climate issues, I'll just go through some of the pledges that they've made on different issues. Uh, they just established a new 2030 goal to reduce CO2 emissions by 70% from a 2000 baseline. Their old goal was 65%, but they've already met it. Uh, primarily because of shutting down coal-fired power plants, uh, which is, again, mostly due to market forces, but uh, shifting goals over time uh, to reflect changes. They also expect to have a 2050 goal uh, to exceed 80% redu reduction and to achieve larger reductions with an overall aspiration of zero emissions by that date. On fleet issues, over the next 10 years, they've committed to retire a substantial amount of additional coal-fired uh, generations, 2,500 megawatts, which will get them largely on their path to having no coal-fired generation uh, by 2050. Uh, they've got a renewable portfolio expansion that they've called for in their integrated resources plan that says we're going to install approximately 8,000 megawatts of wind and solar, which is enormous, uh, and expansion of natural gas by 1,600 megawatts, both of those by 2030. Uh, with respect to additional environmental compliance issues, none of these things on this slide are required by EPA regs uh, or by uh, state level regulations. These are things that they have pledged to do on their own and that they have report on as part of the, the ESG process. They've got an audit policy where they, they evaluate in 2019 50 different sites uh, for, different, for different issues, for different problems. and. Uh, they, they take what they learn from those things and apply them across the, the entire utility system. They established what they call an environmental performance index, which 
creates annual goals related to a variety of different environmental endpoints, opacity, which is an, uh, an air emission issue, water discharge, et cetera. Uh, and they use that to share best practices and to uh, to generate incentives in terms of compensation, if you if you meet your EPI performance uh, metrics, you, that's that is tied to bonuses in the company. And they also have what they call their environmental good catch program, which is sort of an on the spot audit. Something goes wrong, they come up with a way to fix it, and then there's there's no internal penalty for someone who made a mistake, so long as they're part of this uh, good catch program and they've they've applied the good catch program to the issue. This addresses things like wildlife issues too. So they've created an, an avian protection plan, uh, which is all about designing standards for how they construct and maintain their power lines to prevent electrocution. Uh, they, they create uh, nesting areas on uh, poles to keep birds from nesting on, on more dangerous parts of their equipment. They've got a monarch butterfly program that they've established, which they did through the Endangered Species Act through what's called a candidate conservation agreement with assurances. So basically when, when a, a specific species is being considered for protection under the ESA, uh, but it hasn't actually been listed as threatened or endangered, you can enter into uh, an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service in this instance uh, to come up with basically a, a habitat protection plan and a, a mitigation plan for how to protect the species so that hopefully it doesn't even have to be listed. Another major issue for utilities is what they call just transition. Uh, this is really about the workforce, the changing industry and what they're doing for their workforce. So the first thing they did was establish an economic and business development team to develop programs to support economic development and growth in areas where they are shutting down old coal-fired facilities primarily. And they've got a new policy of when a unit retires, there are these four things that they provide. Options for new jobs within the company, outplacement services, if that's the only option, training and resources to local officials to grow and diversify their communities. So looking outside of the company to uh, political uh, in entities and investment in local training and education programs. And beyond those simple things that I think a lot of utilities are doing now, they've also established what they call the Appalachian Sky Initiative, which I think is really impressive and in in involves a significant investment. It's all about uh, attracting the aviation and aerospace industry to central Appalachia, where so many of these coal-fired power plants and coal mines uh, have shut down and those jobs have gone away or, or transitioning away as we speak. Uh, they conducted a comprehensive workforce analysis with consultants and determined that the skills that the coal industry workers had matched up very well with skills that are needed for aviation industry. Uh, and then they worked with local universities and with local and with consultants that they hired to come up with a system for uh, certifying counties in Appalachian states as, you know, aero ready. There should probably be a trademark symbol next to that word. Um, they also established a grant to a local university that would uh, create an aviation program. There's a local airport there that they partnered up with as well. And they partnered up with uh, an agency of, of the federal government, the U.S. Economic Development Administration, uh, to conduct a comprehensive analysis of 23 additional Appalachian counties to do the same sort of thing, whether it's aviation or some other uh, industry. So it's, it's a fairly impressive thing that uh, is certainly relevant to the utility industry, but it's going to be relevant to many, many other types of companies going forward as, as the economy changes. Uh, to, to, to address different types of, uh, of, of green energy. So with that, I will, I will turn it back to Allison to talk about a, the effects of, on ESG issues on a very different type of, of industry. Thanks, Aaron. Um, what we're going to talk about now, we're going to shift away from um, the utility example and instead talk about what a large global investment firm has been doing um, in the ESG space. And this company, uh, has a, a, a large foundation for ESG evaluation within it. Uh, it has principles that they have put together, and they've adopted those as pillars of investment decisions for the firm as a whole. So they evaluate 
what they're going to invest in uh, based on these pillars and looking very hard at ESG issues. They have a 45 member team of ESG experts and it goes beyond just what they're going to, you know, make new investment decisions in, but they also uh, work with the companies in which they have a significant investment to make sure that they are uh, addressing ESG issues in the way that the investment company wants them to and are taking them seriously. And they uh, really go beyond with those companies. And because they are such a large investment firm, they typically will own enough stock in a company that um, they hold a lot of sway. Uh, the company puts out uh, its investment uh, stewardship disclosures report. Um, they come out quarterly, and basically what they do is they highlight the things that the company is voting on in its investments, um, what its engagement priorities are, what companies they've gone to visit, what the outcomes were from those um, from those meetings, and then the types of things that they were engaging in with these companies. Uh, they don't attempt to quantify um, emissions. That's important to note. So. It's not that they're out there trying to get what are the data on each of the companies in which they're invested, how much they're emitting. Instead, what they're focusing on is whether the company is appropriately managing its risks and taking advantage of its opportunities. The investment firm is, is um, very into the idea that climate change presents obviously risk to certain companies, but also a great mem number of opportunities, and it wants to make sure that the companies in which they're investing are adequately looking at that. So each year, this 45-member ESG team will evaluate and identify its engagement priorities for the year. So um, in 2019, 80% um, of its engagements, its meetings with um, folks, were on the issue of the effectiveness of the board. And what they meant by the effectiveness of the board was, was the board um, really uh, looking at diversity? And that means not just within the company, but on the board itself. And what was the board doing in terms of thinking about ESG issues as a corporate strategy, again, assessing the risks and opportunities, and then also in terms of its um, long-term goals. The other thing that they have been engaging with boards on is whether compensation is tied to um, a company's long-term ESG goals. So in other words, uh, you get bonuses when you uh, meet your ESG goals. Uh, maybe you get docked if you do not. Uh, and on the environmental side, um, making sure that the board is involved in addressing climate risk and what are the risks to the business. And that, and that is not just at fossil fuel firms. Uh, this, there is climate risk, they believe, to all companies in terms of their supply chains, uh, you know, weather risks, et cetera, and how much are they looking at that and how are they disclosing. In terms of the social aspect, again, looking at diversity, and also disclosing your political activities. Where are you giving your political lobbying money? Uh, in 2019, they had these engagement meetings with 256 separate companies. So this is a big effort. 80% uh, of those engagements touched on climate in some form or fashion. Another uh, important thing to, to the investment firm is encouraging companies to adopt the SASB or the TCFD, that's the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, accounting methods and, and disclosure methods. Uh, they are, so this is a push from the investment side to try to narrow that list down. As Aaron was talking about, there are so many different platforms to report. They're encouraging these two. Uh, they supported in 2019 10 different um, shareholder proposals. Um, one was very notable where uh, the investment firm went against the board of directors. The board of directors was not wanting to disclose where their lobbying funds went beyond what is required by the law. And uh, the investment firm and other shareholders banded together and overrode the board on that. 
And um, that company is now required to disclose all of its lobbying efforts, not just the ones that are required to be disclosed by law. They're also asking companies to set their um, greenhouse gas reduction targets and you know, weigh their performance against those. And um, they're advocating for companies to, to support reduction policy, policies that would help reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, they've also uh, identified general standards for when they're going to vote against um, the election of certain board members or board recommendations. And this recently did happen. This uh, global investment firm opposed the re-election of two members of a board of directors. They did not get enough votes um, to, to not have those two board members re-elected, but um, the vote was close. And the reasons why this investment firm will um, try to oust a member of a board is if they feel like that board member doesn't have the level of expertise and knowledge that's necessary to assess the company's climate risks, um, if they're not being actively engaged on ESG considerations, or if they're, um, you know, seem to be overcommitted in other areas and not paying attention to ESG matters. Uh, Aaron is now going to talk about um, some government action and a proposed rule on ESG that the Department of Labor is um, engaged in right now. All right. So I think Katie mentioned uh, when she was talking at the SEC that there's a lot of there, there's likely to be a lot of pressure on the SEC going forward to require more and more ESG type information. Um, which I absolutely agree with. And this just goes to show you uh, how a change in administration can have a, a really significant impact on these types of policies as they develop. I'm sure if there is a Biden administration, uh, the SEC is gonna be much more involved in looking at ESG issues. Uh, the Department of Labor, on the other hand, under the Trump administration, issued a proposed rule on June 23rd uh, that would seek to clarify uh, fiduciary duty, duties under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA, uh, and would do so in a way that would make potentially ESG investing uh, for uh, funds regulated or, and for companies regulated under ERISA uh, more difficult to do. Um, ERISA generally requires that fiduciaries act solely in the interest of the plan participants and that the fiduciaries act for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits and paying reasonable administrative expense, expenses. And the proposed rule would seek to define, clarify fiduciary obligations with respect to ESG issues. Obviously, uh, ESG investing assumes that those factors are relevant to a firm's overall financial performance, and people have made strong arguments that the firms that have strong ESG policies have longer term, uh, more likely to be profitable, more likely to uh, survive an economic downturn like the ones that we're seeing right now. Uh, so that's, you know, the concept behind what ESG investing in the first place. Uh, there is standing guidance that's been around uh, for some time now that says uh, ESG investing is allowed under what they call the all things being equal tiebreaker test. So if you're looking at two different investment opportunities, uh, you cannot on a financial basis find a, a, a clear winner uh, between the two. You can use those ESG issues to weigh in favor of one versus the other. Uh, that's you know the basic concept. Um, this proposed rule doesn't it appear to fundamentally change the status quo with respect to that, although there is language throughout the preamble and there is new regulatory language. And anytime you change the regulatory language, it's an opportunity for new interpretations uh, further down the line. The preamble language, however, makes it very clear that, that this administration, this Department of Labor, has some real skepticism about ESG issues. And in particular, I pulled one quote from it. There are a number to this effect. But there's no consensus about what constitutes a genuine ESG investment. And ESG rating systems are often vague and inconsistent, despite featuring prominently in marketing efforts. So obviously, uh, not a particularly uh, enthusiastic endorsement of ESG investing, uh, but also uh, likely true. There's, as we've talked about throughout this, this uh, meeting, uh, ESG issues mean a lot of different things to different people. So 
what does the proposed rule do uh, or what would it do if it were adopted? Uh, it clarifies that a fiduciary has to make investments, quote, based solely on their pecuniary factors and not on the basis of any non-pecuniary factors. So that's different language than, than this in current regulations, but it seems to embody a similar concept uh, to what the current rules say. It also says that first, companies have to uh, compare investments only as to economic matters. That's, that's basically what happens now as well. And then it says ESG can only be considered at this early stage, at this first stage, if the ESG factors, quote, present economic risks or opportunities that qualified investment professionals would treat as material economic considerations under generally accepted investment theories. Again, if, if the ESG issue uh, is you know, financially material, then you can consider it. That's, that's the, the current rules allow that as well. Uh, if, again, the investment options are indistinguishable, then you can look at the non-pecuniary ESG factors. It's that all things being equal tiebreaker test again. So there isn't a massive change in policy, but there's a big change in tone in the preamble in particular, and even in some of the language that is now or that would be included in the reg if, if this proposal were adopted, which opens up a whole lot of risk, uh, a whole lot of uncertainty for companies. Uh, the way that that's potentially mitigated, but it's a new uh, obligation, is if you are going to use ESG factors as a tiebreaker, there is now, or would be, uh, if the rules were adopted, uh, a much more extensive documentation requirement uh, where, where firms would have to explain how they did their balancing, why they thought that, that the two investments were indistinguishable, and how the ESG factors considered were considered in making a decision. So that's a provision that got a lot of attention uh, in comments on the proposed rule. Uh, in general, as you might expect, finance firms, state treasurers, economists did not like this proposed rule at all. Uh, and they primarily argued uh, based on the, the fact that they, they view ESG funds as performing better than, than non-ESG funds. And they particularly point to the performance during the pandemic times, uh, which has generally been very strong. Uh, there were a number of industry groups that were more supportive of the, of the proposed rule, but even they did not like this additional um, somewhat vague documentation requirement. It's, this would be, you know, a, a great rule for lawyers to help you figure out how much documentation is enough. Uh, and it, that's the sort of thing that could easily be litigated uh, and, and could be, uh, you know, years and years of guidance documents trying to make those things clearer for folks. So that's what's going on with the Department of Labor. It's obviously very important what happens there because if that policy is adopted, there might be pressure on other agencies to adopt similar policies that are potentially more skeptical, skeptical of ESG issues. And I'll turn it back over to Allison uh, and Katie, I think, to talk about some additional risks. Yeah, um, we're, this is our last section. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what are the risks that are associated with ESG? And the first one that I want to touch on is litigation risk. And I'm going to do that by talking about uh, two cases that are in existence right now. You need to know these are just two that I've pulled as samples. There are many more. Uh, the case I wanted to talk about is the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus ExxonMobil. This is, was brought by the Attorney General of Massachusetts against ExxonMobil. And the claims in the case are that um, Exxon has been dishonest with two groups of people. First, with its investors about the, the risks it faces because of climate change to its business. And second, they allege that Exxon has been dishonest with consumers about how its products cause climate change. Uh, they also claim that, um, that Exxon had issued misleading statements in its SEC filings uh, using uh, one uh, proxy cost for carbon, uh, you know, a social cost of carbon metric, you know, what is the cost of carbon uh, in its filings and using a different one that was higher in its internal um, documents and decision-making documents. And uh, also that uh, 
they had deceived consumers through greenwashing campaigns for products like called Synergy or Green Mobile to make it sound as though those didn't have greenhouse gas impacts when they when they do. Uh, so this case um, is currently uh, pending in the state court in Massachusetts. Exxon did try to remove it to federal court, but um, were denied that and it's back in federal court. The thing that's interesting about it though is that the complaint was recently amended uh, in June and it really is to add information that's coming from the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the things it talks about is the fact that you can see that when the, the pandemic hit and people then drove less, that there was a big economic impact to um, the company. And they're saying it's similar uh, with the decline in the use of fossil fuels and you have not adequately examined that. The other thing is with regard to the proxy cost that they've been using for carbon, um, that was changed instead of saying that, it, that um, they were um, misrepresenting it. And instead what they're saying is that their practices with that are inconsistent and haphazard. That's the word that the complaint uses. So this is an example of where the right hand really needs to know what the left hand is doing. If you're using a figure in your SEC filings, you need to use the same one internally when you're thinking about um, making decisions. Otherwise, you run a risk. The next case um, is a, a shareholder derivative suit, um, also against um, ExxonMobil, the woods in the name of the case. It's Saratoga Advantage Trust versus Woods is um, Darren Woods, who is the CEO of um, ExxonMobil. And the defendants are Mr. Woods, but also former executives and current executives of Exxon that are listed here on the slide. And the claims are that these officials have engaged in securities fraud um, with regard to their forward-looking um, climate, climate statements. Uh, they were criticized for um, not having done enough to minimize uh, the impact on the business uh, on, on global warming. And they're compared to other large oil companies like uh, Shell or BP that have been thought to have done more. Uh, and so this case is um, currently pending in the U.S. District Court in New Jersey. And um, Exxon is trying to remove it to the Northern District of Texas where there are other shareholder derivative suits pending. And that's the stat status of where this case is. Katie is going to now uh, touch on the last bit of risk and then we'll wrap it up after that. Thanks, Allison. And you know, just, I'm not gonna go through all of these. You know, this is at this point in the presentation, this is stating the obvious. And that is that regardless of what the SEC does and whether or not it ever mandates additional mandatory disclosures on ESG topics, pressure from shareholders and investors is um, on disclosures about ESG matters is only going to increase. And that, um, you know, for example, shareholders, um, including now uh, major institutional investors that represent large voting blocks are effectively using shareholder proposals, for example, on ESG topics as a, a way to pressure companies to provide more um, ESG disclosure. Um, also, you know, I'll just mention in passing that another thing to keep in mind is, you know, we're seeing huge growth in sustainable fund investing, um, which uh, Aaron discussed a bit and essentially um, involves a very broad category of um, investment decisions that, and on funds that are specifically um, tries to direct investment of capital into companies that seek to combat climate change and environmental destruction, while also promoting corporate responsibility. So, public companies should just expect that they, they need you know that they're just going to have more pressure regardless of what the government does um, on these disclosures. So with that, um, we wanted to end with um, just a few takeaways to summarize everything that we've discussed. And from, you know, from my area, you know, the key important thing is obviously that companies need to proactively um, engage with their largest shareholders and to learn, you know, which ESG metrics specifically are important to them. Um, if, if your shareholders, if your institutional shareholders haven't reached out to you yet, they will be. Um, and they also, as they engage in these conversations, need to consider what challenges and risks exist with providing such metrics, 
Another warning um, that I didn't list on the slide is that as you talk to these shareholders, you always have to keep Regulation FD in mind. And while these environmental disclosures that aren't in your SEC reports tend to not be quote unquote material, you have to be very careful to not inadvertently provide, you know, um, a select disclosure, you know, a disclosure of material non-public information to select shareholders during those conversations. So that's just another um, little heads up warning. And also, uh, before a company should um, only include ESG metrics in its SEC reports if it believes uh, those metrics are material to an understanding of its financial performance operations and should keep that new guidance from the staff in mind if it decides to do so. Um, Aaron? A couple takeaways that I uh, wanted to leave everyone with. First off, if you're a reporting company, a disclosing company, uh, when you're designing an ESG program and redesigning it, which has to happen all the time now, uh, deciding what disclosure platform you're going to use or multiple platforms you're going to use and deciding which particular types of pledges your company wants to make, uh, those things can have really important ramifications down the line. Certain pledges match up much better with different reporting platforms. Uh, so making those choices and, and reevaluating them over time is something that companies are going to have to get used to doing. Uh, and second, regulatory developments at a whole variety of federal agencies could be re relevant to these issues. They, they've been around a little while now, but they are still rapidly evolving and emerging. And even if you're not a retirement fund in, uh, a company that would be subject to ERISA, what the Department of Labor is saying uh, on those issues can be really relevant to what other federal rel agencies are going to be saying about them in the future. And once a policy gets set in place uh, in a regulation, it's a lot harder to change course, uh, even just around the edges. So paying attention uh, outside of, of the, the scope of what, what you might ordinarily uh, be looking at as a regulated company is important in this space because so much is changing so quickly. Allison? And finally, uh, you need to be uh, careful that within your company, um, the right hand and the left hand know what each other is doing and that you're consistent throughout all levels of the company with any kind of metric that you're using for ESG. So if you're using one metric one place in your disclosures, you need to be using that throughout the company. If you put up nice uh, statements about sustainability on your website, everybody needs to be aware of what's been said there because it can be used against you uh, in other contexts, um, including in litigation. You also need to stay abreast of what are the developments in this emerging area. Obviously, things are changing quickly. A lot of things are unsettled. We you know, have heard that throughout the presentation today with Aaron talking about something that came out just yesterday. Um, so trying to stay, making sure you're abreast of what is the, are the developments is very important. Uh, we do have, and Aaron mentioned this um, earlier, we have a client group uh, here at McGuire Woods where we advise clients and keep them up to date uh, on all of this information and all of, all of the developments, uh, not just within the U.S., but also internationally on the regulatory level and on the litigation level. It's a flat annual fee, and we have uh, calls with that group once a month to keep you up to date. If you're interested in that, please um, let Aaron or me know. We'll be happy to send you some information and talk with you about that. And finally, if you sent in any questions, you will be hearing from us. Um, we're happy to answer those. And we have here on um, this last slide all of our contact information. Feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions or comments that you may have. We certainly hope that you enjoyed this today, and we're sorry we ran three minutes over, and I hope that's okay. So thank you all very, very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you.